Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to a. N I don't know what number episode this is. I think it's two. I think there was a pile. I did the Hounds of Tindalus. The Hound. Okay, so technically this would be like episode three or something like that. So we'll just call it episode three. This is where I draw a picture or paint a picture, and you listen to me talk about a book I read. And we were talking about the book Seventh with a capital seven, written by Heath Path. Um, he's one of my current favorite authors right now. Also, if you hear, like, a machinery noise, that's the air conditioner, because, um, West Virginia has no mercy. Pretty much. Anyway, so Heath Path, he lives somewhere north. I would say where, but I'm not that kind of person. But, like, I don't think he's a complete Yankee. I don't. But it don't matter. Because, like, I just like using Yankee to fuck with people. That are up north from me. Um, I also think he was part of a military family growing up. And I know that he's married and he lives with his wife. And his wife is absolutely adorable and so are their cats. I think they have a dog. I would like to learn, like, I would like to learn more about him. But I don't want to feel like a stalker. Like I found him on FB and the Instagram. And I even won a sweet book from his newest series. The Warden Path. I love his works. Because he plays a lot with people's moral standpoints a bit, too. The very first books of his I read were The Hungering Saga. And it's not The Hungering Games. But that's how I found his books. I just got a Kindle before I was deployed in 2012. And I wanted to find something to read while I was over there. And I had books. But bringing books overseas is a lot. And I had a lot of books. I used to read way more than what I used to. But a Kindle is a lot more convenient when you're traveling because then you have all your books right there. The problem is, is when you don't have a Kindle anymore, then you have to use your phone. And then that's just awkward, but it doesn't really matter. Someday I will have another Kindle again. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um, I was looking for the last book of The Hunger Games as I was reading it because I have the entire series on my Kindle. That was actually the first series of books I read. And then I accidentally found his series of books called The Hunger Games Saga. I was just like, oh, maybe this is like a story continuation or something. But it's not. It has nothing to do with The Hunger Games in the slightest. But I saw it and I thought, eh, why not? It's a very good series. And it really makes you think whether or not the narrator is as reliable in his telling as he's being quite a brute and somewhat a heartless person who, uh, who's just completely oblivious to how he damages and traumatizes and endangers everybody around him by his actions. Like, you know, he even goes out of his way to kill someone who actually, like, helped him along the way. And it was just one of those things where it was like, oh... That's kind of intense, bro. But that, but he had reasons. He had reasons. And that was one of the things I really liked about that series. Um, he Paths is a really great offer. And I believe you can get his books through Amazon, Audible, Audible Books, and Goodreads.com. I believe you can read them there for free if you just want to check them out at least. And I'll try to find some links for you guys to read. Because, like, God, Ender, it, like, pumps me the fuck off. I need to read Server to Steal, but I've been lazy and I'll get on that eventually. Um, the only gripe I have about the Hungering Saga was, and this is also sort of a spoiler, but I'll do my best to watch what I say. The vinyl villain was weird, and I'm not sure if it's the same thing as the weird powerful guy from the first and second book, who seemed like he would be the main villain, but no. No. Malice took him out. So easy. And I was really hoping his eyes would get ripped out. But there was a reason for why his eyes needed ripped out. It gives him superpowers. It gives him superpowers. Like, you just need to read the series. It's also kind of like furry, but that was before I, I understood or even knew what a furry was at the time. But I don't think it's like furry furry, like internet furry. It's just like actual, oh, this could be based on some like legendary lore, or like folktale or something. Kind of thing. Not like that thing. So that's the difference. Um, but I don't think that that's the same. Like the villain was affected by the same things. Because it seems like he was a pussy when it came to the other villain. The final villain. 
I don't know. I kind of wish there was more of an extension of the story to go more in depth with this side because it was too short-lived for me. I think they were the reason for why the Hungering Saga was going on. I think they were the thing over top of one guy's head that the main character ripped his wings off his back. I don't know. You literally have to read the story because like when I read it, I, I, I like that that book was so great to get through in Afghanistan because the desert's fucking boring. And and plus like, there was one character who I just felt like they were made to be the throwaway character in the hero moment. And it was just like this bitch wasn't even wearing a red shirt. Like what happened to her? Like you know, I, like I, I like I, I can't even say, but who I can't like it is I don't know. If it were to have been Malice who did it, I would have thrown my fucking Kindle and broken it. Like, I'm- like, that's how upset I was about just this character, but if it was a character I absolutely loved, that would have done it for me. That would have made me throw in a book and or electronic device. But anyway, back to the story. So, Seventh is kind of a different story. It gives me the creepypasta kind of vibe to it, you know, where people on the internet write horror stories that aren't really horror stories as much as they're just supposed to be like thrillers that are supposed to creep you out. You know, um, I listened to some like Dark Sonomon or whatever the fuck his name is. I don't know. I'll try to remember to tag him in this as well. He reads creepypastas, but he does it in a really orchestrated way. It sounds a lot like some theater shit and he's got like a nice voice for it and he has a good setup and it's like, I really like this guy. I can listen to him all night, and I and I do sometimes. Sometimes I'll just have my headphones in, and I'll be listening to his shit or some other shit on YouTube playing. I don't know. It's just I've always had YouTube playing like all the time because I like oversharing um, my personal life when I'm trying to do a video about a book. So I digress. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this feels like a creepy pasta, but it's a published story, so I don't think it's a case of a creepy pasta. But it could have been. That's the energy it gives me, right? So it's a short sci-fi novel that's set on some space colony or ship or something. And it's called The Odyssey, right? I'm pretty sure it's a ship, anyway. The book starts off with a log from a patient named James Wright. James starts off his log with waking upon the red flashing lights in his room. And he wakes up cold in his bed from the warning sound. And, and something's happening to the ship. So Wright's got questions, and he questions the computer of the Odyssey, which comes in with the Karen voice, and he informs the reader that he's about to become a shipboard security officer, and he's only been on the ship for three weeks, so he doesn't know everything about the ship, right? That's what we've gotten so far, right? I'm just letting you all know, because I don't care. In this book, you're going to realize James is an incredibly terrible liar. Liar lighter liar i only said lighter because i like i was about to. so james just happens you know to just be he'd be on this ship for like three weeks he's only been there for three weeks right um so pay attention to the time frames too because it's a little bit weird the computer is a female voiced ai that makes james feel uneasy the for every time he speaks to it and he feels like the ai hates him which is some really heavy feelings to get from a computer voice that just sounds like Siri. Oh, I would imagine, like, if, it, if, if the AI was Siri, I would be so happy. I miss having an iPhone. Siri was the only thing I liked about an iPhone. If Google ganked the Siri shit, I'd be so thrilled, because then I'd be like, I could have Siri again, because I have an Android and it runs with Google, so I need that shit in my life, right? Um, Odyssey tells Wright that there's been a severe breach in the hall and all the crew members are pretty much confined and or locked in their rooms until further notice. When Wright asks what happened, all she tells him is that there's that the system has some faults in it. So he asks her what the ETA status is on repairs and damages and all that, and there and there's none according to the AI. No and and none of the engineers have been registered to do anything. Maybe they're locked in their rooms too. But would the system prevent that? Somehow? I mean, like if the people who are in charge of working on the ship are locked in their rooms because something happened with the ship. Would the, would the ship really lock them in there and prevent itself from saving itself? See, like, the, like, 
like, and I, and I can't say I didn't like this book, but it caused me to ask a bunch of questions along the book that made me really frustrated. Um, where I had a lot of questions, much like I did, considering none of it made any sense. But he ends up asking the AI if there was any report for the breach, and she's like, No! He makes her turn on the lights, and she's like, well, ten, well, he doesn't really make her do that. He asks her to, and she still tells him no. And she's like, I'm on emergency power. I can't do that. And at some point, he mentions aloud how he's stuck in the room, and the AI says, yes. Not yes as in agreeing, but in a weird way that makes James notice that the AI doesn't like his jokes. Or he's way more hostile than what it seems to him. Like, that's what he's getting from it. I guess he just doesn't vibe with the AI to begin with. But he's got reasons. he got reasons. Um, the temperature starts getting to right, so he asks what the temp is. She asks whether he wants the temp for the room or for the outside of the room. And he chooses the cabin temp. She tells him that it's 21.1 Celsius, which is like 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Or 70 degrees in American, depending on if, if, if you're American or not. Because I think we're the only ones that use the imperial system now. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> but either way, it's a comfortable temperature. Um, maybe a little sweaty, but it, it's nowhere unbearable. Maybe he's just feeling the heat or whatever, right? Wright keeps having this feeling like there's something wrong with his room. But it could also be because he's afraid of what's going on and all the danger that's in the air. I mean, like, it's a pretty frazzled moment for the guy, right? You gotta give him the benefit of the doubt. Well, then Wright thinks of trying to communicate with somebody, and he gets a hold of Chief Hewler, who is a nervous wreck for some reason. Like, I, I guess for some reason, Fueler asked Wright what's going on and knew his name... And Wright jerks it off as protocol for the AI to give names like a snitch. Anyway, now that both of these men have no idea what's going on together, they both panic together. And this is the first time he asks Wright about helping, but it gets ignored. Wright tells him that he isn't sure what's happening because he was napping when the warning lights and sirens woke him. The tree screams the most vanilla damn it you can imagine and then gets quiet. And Wright had to check and make sure he was still there. I guess, like, I don't know, maybe it was like a, a, a mental crisis or something. He just kind of lost his shit for a second. Um, the Chief explains a bunch of stuff that really I don't understand, but something about an energy output that cut through three levels of the ship. He went to call the bridge, then he blacked out or something. Then somehow he woke up in a pool of his own blood. Um, Fuller broke his nose off the console, but he doesn't remember how, and then he asks Wright to help. Now, this is the second time he's asked Wright for help, and Wright just straight finesses him and asks more questions. Fuller seems confused when he told Wright it was the tether where the breach was located, I believe. Is that what I wrote? Yeah, that's what I wrote. Um, he was confused when he was explaining that the tether is where the breach was located. As if, like, he wasn't sure that was the right answer. Which, I kind of have to stress, because that, like, it kind of threw me off, too. Like, why doesn't he know? Well, maybe he just can't see, but... Why doesn't he know? Like, it should be something. I don't know. Um... Where was I? He also told Wright he's only he's the only communication he's had since he's woken up. There's no communication anywhere, and Fueler explains that this shouldn't happen. It seems no other departments or people are alive. Wright's the only sign of life that Fuller can ex has experienced since this entire thing started, and Fueler can't leave his office as he's on lockdown as well. It seems the power source is failing. And the source would last at least five years, but because of the damage in the hall, and it's being held together by the status field, all the power is being used up at a high consumption rate. I don't know, but I guess it's at a rate that makes them all panic, because at five years it goes to like maybe three hours. I assume it's three hours. I want to put a time limit on it, because I don't remember if there was one in the book. Um... <laughs> but basically, once all the power is out, the ship's going to go down like the Titanic, but worse. It's probably going to implode. I think things implode in space. I don't know. 
At some point, someone knocks on Fuller's door and he hangs up, leaving Wright alone to think about what was just told to him. He describes his feelings of one being stuck in a prison cell with only a few hours to spare before his death sentence comes in a form of the ship ripping itself apart. He started wondering about if the escape pods were still available when a knock comes to his door, too. And it was three heavy knocks hitting the metal door, and Wright does the horror tradition of yelling hello. But then he remembers, hey, this is a soundproof room. They can't hear me, but why can I hit, hear them? Better yet, how did the chief hear the knocks, too? We shouldn't be hearing any kind of knocks of any kind, especially since this is a soundproof room. He calls the chief back and Fuller suspects it's a rescue party, but also knows that they can't hear if he screams out to them. I don't know if the chief realizes he shouldn't be able to hear them right back other than thinking maybe it's a signal, but it, it still doesn't make sense, you know. But Wright picks this up immediately, so it's like, whatever, Wright's the hero of the story, I assume. Um, <coughs> there's a light going off in the room, you know. What other signal does there need? Like, you know, there's a life going off in the room. What other signal needs a thumping, loud, knocking sound like that? You know, like, if everything's going off, why would the rescue party start knocking on doors knowing that there are people already on the ship? Yeah, like, you know, it's a weird thing to suggest, I guess. Anyway, something scares the chief, and Wright asks what happened, and Fuller says there's someone in his room, but then the signal goes out, and when Wright tries to reconnect again, Odyssey says there isn't anyone available anymore. It's almost as if Fuller was foreshadowing exactly how he and Wright would be separated from each other, but if only that were the case, Fuller's character actually has a strange excuse as to why he knows so much and so little about what's going on with the ship. His job department is in the power maintenance and energy preservation, so I assume that has something to do with the engineering as well as engines and shit. Because, I don't know, and I'm just pulling shit out of my ass. He knows where the damage is in the hull with the tether, whatever that is, but he also says that he can't access the information from his terminal because he isn't part of that particular department. But his job is in the power preservation and power maintenance. Why wouldn't he have access to that from his terminal? It may make more sense if he said, I can't access this because I don't remember the password. Um, Worky's making us change the shit every month, so I just got lazy and set up a quick login on the computer. But that's not what he says, and that's not the case. He's in the central office, but he can't find access or a way to get into the computer to learn what's going on exactly. He just knows something happened that's sucking away power from a focal point in the tether. But that, shouldn't that be an engineering crew thing? Shouldn't the engine team and maintenance crew be able to have access to that same information? As they would need to access that shit. Wouldn't that fall under maintenance? Why wouldn't the people responsible for making sure the battery works has access like any other department? I don't understand how certain, like I understand how certain MOS classes in the military are different and interlinked, but I'm not sure this is the same. Um, speaking of the military, I can't help but be slightly annoyed at the lo at a lower class officer ignoring orders of a fucking chief. I don't mean for the military mode to come out, but Wright does mention the rank being important, yet he basically is ignoring the chief when he keeps asking him to try to find help or contact somehow. I'm pretty sure the chief thinks that possibly in his panicked and disoriented state that Wright perhaps called for help. That is a theory. He did wake up in a pool of his own blood. It's just strange how these two characters are handling each other. As if the chief is looking for right to lead rather than the other way around. Are, are, you, are you getting where this book is going yet? Okay, either way. So there's already something fucky about how the narrator is coming off. You know, like there's something unreliable about what he's saying and we're not sure about it yet. But don't worry, it, it, get, it gets there. It's actually ended up being way longer to write. Because I ended up writing more details about the entire plot than what I intended, which is crazy because, like, well, I, I guess it's not crazy because it is a novel. It is a little, a, a little tinged longer than everything else, right? Um, so back to the story, Wright finds, tries to find somebody, but there isn't an answer from the AI, which 
creeps him out. It gets even more creepy when he starts trying to get the AI to respond to commands, and it doesn't. It actually doesn't say anything to him. And then there's this hiss in the air that comes out of nowhere. And he jumps, and he realizes there's something in his room as well that he can barely make out. With all the red light that keeps flashing. Anyway, um, it was apparently that was the hiss that he heard. And so he screamed. And that wasn't the best move because I guess the thing grabbed him and shoved him against the door of the room. And he was trying his best not to have to look at whatever the thing was that grabbed him. I mean, he hears a kid's voice anyway saying, we're all dead now, remember? And then he feels this sharp pain in his neck and there are voices. And then all of a sudden he's in some medical ward waking up. To the bright lights above. And he ends up talking to this female doctor. And she call and he then he calls himself a cadet. Which makes me even more annoyed. That he ignored the chief. Because why is a cadet ignoring the orders of a chief? You know I'm just saying. When I was a specialist. I would have got my ass. I'm like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it actually doesn't matter. That's just what. That's just a nitpick of mine. Like why is a cadet ignoring the orders of a chief? You know. Um. The doctor tells him he's suffering from DSD, or Deep Space Dementia. In this story, there are seven dimensions, and there are ways to travel through the dimensions for faster movement through space. The problem is, is that people can develop this DSD, which not only makes them incapable of differentiating reality from fantasy, um, they also become homicidal maniacs and are considered extreme high risk and hostile to anybody who, you know, might encounter them. So that sharp pain was right getting a shot that allowed him to become sane for a moment while they got him to where he needed to be in order to reverse the effects of the DSD. So, right now we're establishing that Wright is out of his fucking mind and he needs medicine to keep him in his right mind. Now, while they got him to where he needed to be in order to reverse the effects of the DSD, he'll have to go through a process in order to repair the damage from the DSD, which they called Rebuild. But he'll pretty much lose a week or so of memories because they have the system restore. I think they called a cerebral scan for your brain. So the moral of the story is to save like it's a PlayStation 1 memory card every day and as often as fucking possible. Now, Wright's happy to know that, he, that he's just been tripping this entire time, and I totally feel him. If I thought there was something that grabbed me in the room, and, like, a captain covered in his own fucking blood after waking up from it, is telling me I need to go get help when I can't get the fuck out of a room, you, yeah, like, I, I would be happy to know I, I, I was tripping. You know, he let the nurses that are surrounding him strap him onto a gurney and take him wherever he needs to go. The restraints are also work to put him to sleep as well, so he's just getting ready to knock off. When the one nice nurse lady who was talking to him and explaining his whole DSD diagnosis tells him she's going to cut him apart and wake him up to watch his insides get ripped out looking for his darkness. She threatens to also go after his family and becomes this Jim Burton slash Yoan Vasquez like creature. And then he passes out. At some point he can hear his own voice say something about, I freed them, you can't have them before fully waking up in a corridor somewhere on the ship. How did he get there? I have no idea. He asked Odyssey, twice, mind you, before it answered, where he was, and it tells him he's on E13 near the Comfort Center. So when he asked how he got there, Odyssey says he walked there, but in a weirdly bitchy way, as Wright describes it. And he's confused, as he was in the medical bay previously, and he doesn't remember walking there himself. But... She tells him that he's never been in the medical bay. And he's just like... Okay, so this is definitely like some fucked up... Like, I know I was there, but whatever. So now he's sure he's crazy. He goes and takes a stroll around the center. And enjoys all the plants and stuff there. When he notices that someone's following him from behind. And he only knows it's because the person had been walking in step with him. Or at least they were trying to. And then at some point they missed the step. And he's just like... Wait, wait a minute, like, someone doesn't know how to be in step with another soldier. And it, and it was something that was, like, really fucking odd to pick up. So it's like, w the writer of this book definitely knew a little bit about the military. Because, like, if someone were behind me and I suddenly heard their footsteps and they're not going to keep it in step with me, I definitely would be someone to pick that up and be like, who's walking? Who can't keep a fucking beat? You know, like, that, like, his cadence and shit, but that's just me. 
and he could see that it was a man, which shouldn't have surprised him since he was pretty much in the wreck room of the ship. And I don't know why that wasn't. Why I don't know why that was a thing. I I don't know. I I, re I wrote that in this script because I do script these out and I add ad lib sometimes, but um, I don't know why I wrote. I can't remember why I wrote that, and I literally steady read this book and was taking notes as I read this book. I'm not doing that again, because this actually took me a minute to get through. But the the dude who's following him is legit following him. Like, still. Very sh for sure. Wright even goes up so far as to walk funny, and here's the other guy fucking up the following in steps. So he turns around and asks the guy, hey, what the dealio? And the other man doesn't answer. So Wright starts taking a few steps, the other guy takes a few steps back. And that's when Wright realizes that there's something up with the guy, and immediately, he's just like, I need to get away. And he starts running, right? Then a chick's voice is all like, oh, there you are. And I guess it's coming from his stalker, who is the dude, but it's a chick's voice coming out. And then Wright is all like, um, do I know you? And the chick says she was looking for him, or as, bo as the body of the person following him starts to snap. And dude, we're twisting shit at the joints. Making it look like a spidery, weird thing. It's actually a pretty descriptive, gross thing, honestly. There's a lot of gross descriptives in this book, honestly. I don't know if that's your forte. That's my forte, but I, I will spare you on some of it. Not all of it. And plus, like, you should be reading this book to read the juicy way he writes his details anyways. Because he's really good at, like, be with descriptive writing, too. Like, please, read his books. Because, like, he's a really good author. So anyway, right as do I know you, and she transforms into like a a a, a, a mega whatever. Right says he isn't well, and the voice repeats the exact same shit it said before as it legs bend backwards, and all of a sudden becomes this monstrosity looking spider thing on four legs. So right is all like I have DSD, and she's like I'm a human spider, and starts crawling on all fours in a fuck way right at right. And that gets him to finally start running in fear, because I guess all the other crazy shit she was doing wasn't enough. But I don't know if his fight or flight was kicking it, or... Mm -mm. It finally it finally says that it hurts and it needs help, looking like a woman's body had been stretched over an exoskeleton, as it's described in the book. And Wright is praying for a way to get out of this, and he finds a room that has the AI lock the door behind him. And Odyssey eventually starts reminding him after the door is locked. <clears throat> about filing a security report. And then it does it again. And again. And again. And again. And at some point, the AI calls Wright a murderer and asks for the security report over and over and over again. Even talking over Wright as he gets, as he's confused about what's happening to him. Is it the DSD or something else? So it gives the report, but the Odyssey does some weird shit again. It tells Wright that it is already too late and that he knew it. Wright was rightfully confused and wondering just how badly the DSD was making the person suffering go nuts. And it seems like he's going on an incredible, crazy journey that his brain is just not releasing him from. But then the story is all like, but wait, there's more. Like, literally, that's what it does. He tries to ask for the time, but the AI gives him some crazy-ass number that's obviously wrong. So then he tries to ask where the nearest security locker is and Odyssey doesn't answer. But this nav thingy that was installed into his eyeballs come on to give him directions, but this means he has to leave the room he's in and he doesn't know if the thing that chased him was still outside of the door or not, since the soundproof door decided to be soundproof again magically during this book. So he asks if there's a different way around, and the Odyssey just starts trolling him pretty much. It even calls him love, and he gets annoyed with that. Wright just eats it and walks towards the audience chamber, and he sits down in one of the seats when some guy in a medieval clothing announces his presence by clearing his throat, scaring the crap out of Wright, who doesn't even know he's in there at all. This dude is like a Coraline carrier with obsidian marble eyes and razors for teeth. It was one of those things where it was like, what? The literal shit. Now, Wright, of course, rightfully asks, what the fuck? And the dude said he goes by the name Worm, but he also had other names. 
Now Wright says that it's a pretty dumb name and thinks that he's an alien, but Worm laughs at this. This laughter helps Wright determine that Worm probably isn't the nicest guy he's met so far in this crazy adventure. Worm says that he's the keeper of answers and that Wright has to find him again or something. And then he just ceases to exist in that spot, according to the cadet. Like he vanished or some shit. Wright goes to the bathroom to gather himself and then he uses the control console to relax his brain for a second. And he ends up looking in the mirror and sees something wrong with his face. Or at least his face is the wrong age. He also notices he's in a gray jumper with a barcode, but he can't figure out why he can't remember the details of the outfit. Or why he's even wearing it to begin with. Maybe his DSD is so advanced now that it's causing him to forget what he looks like or what's even happening. He's seeing shit and things aren't going the way they're supposed to. And I'm pretty sure this is at this point the first time he sees an older version of himself and it's in the mirror. More on that later. He eventually uses the controls to find a better route to, to the security lockers and starts making his way when his old friend Lady stretched over a weird body finds him. He screams, of course, and then runs for his life, and this thing just starts shrieking, help me, with its full chest, all caps, as it comes after him. When he manages to dive to the next door and tries to close it, the thing gets him at the leg and starts biting the fuck out of him. It's like an ankle biter, but it actually does damage. He tries to fight it off with a punch, but it grabs his arm. Finally, he gets a leg free and kicks it in the face, which also causes his face to be ripped off and reveals a smooth surface underneath. He manages to get away and run again with the thing stunned for a minute because you know you really don't know how to take losing half of your face so you might need a minute you know especially when it came at the in the form of a kick by a guy who if it bit his leg like you know this thing it's like the way the book describes it's pretty greasy in the canadian sense it's, it's a pretty like nasty looking creature and it's teeth are like razors and needles too so it's just like you had all that shit on you sir you are not getting on this laptop i'm doing things i know you want to he actually puked on my laptop earlier i was really big sads about that but not today sir i don't know man like if i got my fi if i got my whole face kicked off like, I probably need, like, a, a good head shake or two before I decided, you know what, I, now I'm not playing. Like, I wasn't even about to take your face off, but you took mine off, so at this point, I can do whatever I want to you now. So, Wright got a good distance before his legs started hurting, finally, and the roaring of the thing chasing him sounded the hall as he was running down. <clears throat> Now Wright grabs a chair and gets ready for the thing, like a Treyu with the wolf guy from the never-ending story. The chair does keep some distance, it, but it almost rips his neck out when the, when the fucking monster thing tries to jump on him. He heads back to the main hall again since it was closer, but then the thing grabs his bad leg from underneath it, and then it's like, oh, there you are! Like, the thing's got jokes now, lol. Um... Somehow, though, he is saved from that thing and he hears footsteps approaching as the thing that was on top of him about to rip him to shreds is just not on him anymore. There's a dude with a pipe covered and who knows what. And what that could be, we don't know yet. His name is Hobbs. Hobbs helps. Hobbs helps right. Hobbs helps right in giving him some space drugs to make his shit better and the two talk. Or... Er, Wright thinks that it's weird that there's military personnel on the ship, and Hobbs is basically a dude who doesn't ask questions, so he really doesn't know either. Even though, he literally talked to an officer earlier, who was also on the ship, and he's working to be a security officer. Why wouldn't- this sounds like a, like a ship that should have military- like, oh, never, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. But anyway, like, Wright thinks it's weird that there's military personnel on the ship, and Hobbs is basically a dude who doesn't ask questions, and he doesn't really know why he's there either. Wright, for a second, thinks about killing Hobbs, but he gives himself away with talking out loud, and eventually Hobbs is blurred out how his fellow troops woke up to an emergency sound and how everyone was attacked by strange shadows that came from the walls that appeared. Um, it made one guy go nuts, and start screaming. Another couple of guys tried to stop the screaming dude down and, and calm him down, but that didn't work. Another dude punches screaming dude, and that doesn't work. Then some guy tells him to shut the fuck up. And when 
And when screaming shut the fuck up didn't work, the guy injected like six steroid shots in and ended up tearing the Marks guy literally apart. And I think the Marks guy, yeah, the Marks guy was the one he was screaming. Um, so he basically injected a whole bunch of steroid shots, like the ones that he used to help right out with into the guy and he just tearing him limb from limb um hobbs team who weren't affected left the rest after they bypassed the weird shit but they ended up in the cafeteria where they find a whole place full of corpses turned zombies there are zombies on this boat and they're not just regular zombies but they are zombies with weird red intestinal attached cords that went from each body to some being that was also in the room with them but they never actually found out what controlled these bodies but his crews did find out that they could sever the connection with whatever was controlling the zombies and the zombies themselves. Unfortunately, most of the crew were torn apart and their dead bodies too joined the ranks of the undead puppets of the Ray Cold that's attached. Now, I just want to say that I, every time I read this, forget about Hobbes in the story and he surprises me every time. I don't know why, but since he has such an exciting story so far, at least he can fight and shit, but I never remember that he's here. And then, like, I was doing this for this video, and all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I remember why he wasn't there. I, re I remember why he wasn't there. So Hobbs convinces Wright to go with him to the bridge to see if there's anything they can find out. And then suddenly, Wright passes out, thinking maybe Hobbs drugged him, which would be a weird thing to do. Why would you? Why would he drug you? During a time where Richard is trying to kill you, like, he would lug your body around, like, bait or something? Like, why would- why, that doesn't make any sense to drug somebody. Well, Wright wakes up, and he's holding Hobbs' wetchin, weapon, which is now covered in blood. And Hobbs is passive, passive as fuck as he addresses Wright, and tells him he can have the weapon and carry the meds kids. Hobbs says they can go to the comfort center, like, where Wright was at before, instead of the bridge like he originally wanted to. Wright doesn't think anything about this. Like, if I know you noticed the blood on your weapon, sir. You know? Um, the soldier who told you all about the monsters he just fought against is acting timid. He's also staring down the opposite hall of where you're going, and it makes me wonder who or what was causing him to look that way. Like it was a bad thing. Because it's obviously a problem. And I also don't think that they're in the same place as before in the book, either. But we'll get to that in a little bit. So they get to the comfort center and Wright is just all smiles at the whole I'm one with nature stuff. Until he sees what I assume is possibly Worm. But then I was wrong because there is way more medieval hooded guys everywhere. They were passing through walls and doing all kinds of things. People see orbs do. Uh, Hobbs is acting like Wright is the man of the relationship and doesn't move until Wright leads the way. They make their way around the road, guys, but not without them giving the two men a warning to not get close or just dirty looks like bitches give. Um, Hobbs is completely silent, and now Wright is starting to wonder what the fuck, man, is your problem? You know, like, why are you, why are you acting this way? Why are you so quiet? What's going on with you? Right? What happened? Pretty soon, the rogue guys are like jellyfish in the ocean, and and Wright starts hearing the weird folk whispering with the breeze, wherever the breeze came from, right? Talking about the worm, and, and I guess that's its awakening. Meanwhile, Wright has totally forgotten about its space madness that's going on. Never does he go out of his way to, to be like, hey, maybe this weird stuff's happening is all in my head after this point of the story. Like, he does on occasion, but not to the point where he, like, you know. Like, if, if you never dealt with someone who's going through, like, full delusions, they don't think that what they believe or see or think is fake. They Like, they totally believe it. They totally believe it's real. So, at this point, it's just like he's just full-on enveloped. He's full-on in it. There's no getting out of it. Wright threatens the cloaked people, and they all laugh at him for it. Or maybe he thinks they are, because Wright isn't sure at this point. But the crowd actually moves out of the way for him after he tells them to get the fuck out the way for him and Hobbs. He eventually falls at some point, but he sees a cloaked guy talking to another guy who looks like an officer from the ship. Officer Dude says he's surprised and happy that Wright made it as far as he did, since everyone, in quotations, 
thought he wouldn't make it. And the dude starts doing the whole, I, you're here to fulfill your destiny, James Spiel, right? Because his first name is James, in case you forgot, because I did throughout this book. He was just like, oh yeah, his name is James. My bad. <laughs> he gave this spiel to write. It makes it sound like there's something astrologically prophesied about this worm thing, and James should have been raised for this moment. And that's why he's back on the Odyssey. Dude also calls Wright Sergeant, not Cadet, and this confuses Wright a lot, and he's getting pissed. I was also confused, and then it was just like, oh yeah, and then I remembered the ending. It was just like, oh, okay. Wright starts asking the weird officer about what's going on, and he, and he really just tells him what Wright already knows about the ship, which pisses him off some more. Because he's being more specific with the guy when he asks why there were weird jellyfish in cloaks roaming the ship like this. And why this shit is happening on the boat. And what the fuck is even he talking about this prophecy and shit. So the dude asks if he wants to know what's happening. And then he just pulls out a knife. And he's just like, oh god, there's gonna be a knife fight. But at least that's what Wright thinks. He thinks he's gonna get stabbed at this point. But no, Officer Dude just... Does a full Harry carry and starts stabbing his guts away, killing himself, and shouts that this is for you, James Wright. And he also tells Wright right before he goes to find someone, but he doesn't say who. I almost want to believe this was the officer Wright spoke to earlier, but I really don't know because I'm reading this story and I don't remember this part in particular. I don't think, hell, I'm only right on this as I go slowly because the story was kind of hard to read the first time for me. And reading it a second time, I found that it's not my most favorite story of his. It's not like it's bad or that I don't like it. It's just kind of like off to me, like he could have been rushed to write this or maybe it was a younger piece, but I just didn't love this story in particular. But maybe one of you will like it enough to read it. Sure, I'm spoiling the story, but it's still good enough to read, and if you like sci-fi and adventuring gory little bits, you might, you know, you might like the story. You might like it. Anyway, so, back to the actual story that we're talking about. The dude stabs himself, a bunch of hands get laid on the right, like it's church, and he kind of blacks out, or he flashes suddenly to the next scene. I can't tell and neither can he, but he ends up back in the same room with the red blinking light like in the beginning of the novella and Wright is rightfully confused as fuck. Even more weird, Hobbs is sitting on the bed with a thousand yard stare locked on Wright. He opens his mouth and everything goes black, flashing red in the room again as Hobbs asks if Wright remembers how they got there. Then Wright asks if Hobbs is okay and Hobbs responds that he isn't because Wright killed him. Oh, that, it, it makes sense why he's acting different now, huh? Um, right, it's like, what the fuck? But Hobbs makes it clear that it's so easy to forget when you don't want to remember. In regards to the murder and Wright's outright denial. Um, Wright tells Hobbs to quit with his bullshit because he's never intentionally hurt anyone before. But as I've stated before at the beginning of this whole telling, um, Wright is a very terrible liar. In fact, I doubt he's the best, and he doesn't even realize. The room gets dark, and Hobbs gets up from the bed to stand in front of Wright, and this is so Wright could see that Hobbs' left side of his head was caved in, and the eye was hanging out of his face. His brain parts were dripping out of his head, too. Hobbs claimed that Wright didn't trust him with the weapon and wanted the med kits, and that's why he was murdered. But the med kits won't work because they're linked up to Hobbs' biometrics or whatever. He then claims that his killing was just another notch in Wright's belt. Or in layman's terms, Wright is pretty much a serial killer. Wright ends up just closing his eyes and screaming that Hobbs is a real and is a part of the DSD. When he opens his eyes, Hobbs is gone. Then Odyssey asks Wright if he feels alone. When Wright starts to question the ship or what he thinks is the ship, Odyssey tells him that he killed her son and daughter. Then the ship laughs at him and he again denies being a killer but the ship isn't having it and says that they ha they're with him forever. When he asked who it was that was addressing them with the new accusation, there was silence and then the door opened. Wright, of course, was suspicious from the start as this whole thing has been insane. The door, as he describes, would usually go out to a hallway then went to other cabins on the ship, but now it's like there's one long hallway from his room way out there. 
Uh, Wright decides to leave the room despite his feelings. Hobbs shows back up without all the wounds and stuff. And Wright says that Hobbs is a hallucination, but Hobbs tells Wright when he comes back to this place, he's real again. When Wright steps out of that room, it helped him become a real person again. Now, Wright doesn't understand quite what Hobbs is saying, but asks where here what. Hobbs says that they are on the brink of darkness and Wright's been there before and he needs to find the worm that everyone keeps talking about. Wright tries to get more information but the next thing you know he's in a house on some planet somewhere and the emotions in the room he smells is like so familiar. Then a woman named Karen was talking Literally, her name is Karen, was talking to Wright, and she notices that he's covered in blood. Wright, who must have been experiencing the memory, is smiling as he said that, quote-unquote, it's better this way. I had to kill them, Karen. And then Wright gets control back and is screaming that none of it's real. However, Hobbs ends up coming back and informs Wright that he's never been linked up to the ship in order to speak to Odyssey. And that was never Odyssey's voice. All of his implants were removed when he got convicted. But convicted for what? Hmm. Wright argues that he was talking to the ship before in his bunk, and that's when they first met each other, that Hobbs' story is similar to Hibbs. But Hobbs informs him that who he was talking to never really told him anything true, and that Wright had jumped him from behind and stole his shit after Hobbs had saved him. Kinda explains why Wright blacked out after Hobbs invited him to the bridge ship and why Hobbs acted like he was just not involved in the story in a personal and mental way. Like he checked out completely on a conscious level. Mainly because he's a ghost. Or he's just his self-haunting, if you will, his murderer. Wright said he would never do that, but Hobbs calls bullshit and says Wright made this place and that all the machines could dig in his head. Wright thinks about the shit and does agree that the whole stretcher thing, as well as the cloak people, were kind of off. He asks Hobbs if they messed with his memories, and Hobbs said they tried, but it would affect some project. Then Hobbs becomes a young boy by the name of Sean that Wright is the father of. Sean's eyes are missing, and the sockets are oozing black stuff. Sean says, hi dad, and suddenly Wright remembers that he did murder his son, with a knife he brought for that reason. Um, he remembers coming home and the kids running to him all happy to see their dad right before he slaughtered all of them. I won't go into details, but he's pretty much going into heavy stuff he does to his family. At some point he starts to cry and the ghost of his wife appears to tell him to nut up. She was murdered too, just like her family. She and her son both say that Wright had brought the darkness and the worm into their home and they're now all suffering because of it. Wright doesn't know why he ends up saying the words, he said I could save you, but Karen just does a Karen smile with a half, half a jaw and disappears again into the darkness. Light comes on and he's in some kind of control room with a chair. It was deja vu for him, he knew he'd been here before, even though he couldn't exactly remember even referring to it as home. Wright ends up calling it the tether room. The chair in front of him turned around and a version of Wright was sitting in the chair ready to judge the doppelganger. But instead it's a memory and Wright realizes this older version that he saw of himself earlier in the mirror was a sergeant now, not a cadet. Um, Wright remembers that he was in charge of the Deep Space Shield research team that was researching, jumping their ships through 7th space, making it the fastest form of space travel. However, as Wright recalls, the actual process to do this successfully was pretty much nil to nada. Either things came out all messed up and deformed, or not at all. Wright was actually responsible for reopening the project and invented the Tether Pro, which made equipment loss a thing of the past, and they will be able to gather information without losing it in 7th space. The Odyssey was equipped with a probe and the tether room, with six volunteers and the equipment could be sent through theoretically without issue, and this was proven right for the first time, from what he recalls. Older Wright starts talking to him and explaining how they, younger and older Wright, learned so much information from their project and research. Apparently Karen, his wife, wasn't happy and threatened for a divorce, and even though Wright begged her to understand, he ends up just going no contact with her, not caring because his work was more important, I guess. But this is what he's telling us now, and we don't know if he's referencing the time before 
he murdered his family or after because him saying he went no contact but his family turning up being like oh we're dead because of you um two very contradictory things did he leave her alone or did he go on a murder spree um Either way, Sergeant Wright invites his younger self to look at the research that the two of them have been working on, and Wright sees that the research involved rooms that looked exactly like the one he started in when the novel first started. Uh, a dark room with a red blinking light and warning signals. And there were six volunteers all sleeping, but one wakes up startled by the flashing lights and stuff. The first one asks who's there and that they're sick, and another one gets up to stare at the camera all creepy-like. Then one room just has all bones crunching and blood everywhere because I guess they exploded. Um, the first guy starts vomiting like a toddler just out of nowhere. And then a woman subject starts clawing out of her stomach, screaming like it hurts. Two of the occupants hadn't moved yet, but it seemed like everyone went mad in the rooms in a bad way. Was right like this? I guess he couldn't tell with his own perspective, but we really don't know because he does have DSD. Or does he at this point? Point? We don't know. Well, the subject sure do. And Wright realizes that while the tether is fine, the volunteers were not. And volunteers is sounding a lot like a different type of subject, but more on that later. But I'm just saying, I don't think they're actual volunteers who can give consent, if you will. Wright figures, oh, if I just calibrate this different, that should change the effects of the DSD, but he doesn't bother caring much for the subject's conditions. The woman's clawing out her stomach, and two of the subjects are in the same room in each other's face now. One of the subjects ended up talking to Wright and snapping his own neck, and Wright just watches him on the floor like this was a normal thing. Which has to make one wonder exactly how many times Wright actually did this kind of experiment to quote-unquote volunteers. The next thing that catches Wright's attention is the fact that the two subjects in the same room started eating each other were the last ones now alive, and the rest were dead, fucked up in weird circumstances. The other Wright was gone, but then at some point his daughter comes into the picture. Now Wright already knows what he's done to his daughter and he remembers anything, so he really doesn't want to look at her, and she keeps asking him, What did you do, Daddy? And I figure she's really a young girl because he reaches down to pet her head. So suddenly Wright recalls that he has to find the worm and bring it home, which I'm not sure what that means exactly. Like, maybe I'm dumb, but I didn't get it. Is it a metaphor? Is it a full-on delusion? I'll never know. I could ask the author on the FB, but I don't think he'd answer because he's a pretty big deal, and I don't want to be that guy, and I don't want to be that stalker either. So anyway, Wright's daughter hugs him. And he mentions that she has tiny arms and he can't bear to look at her because he knows he doesn't want to acknowledge, acknowledge what he did. He says it's because he doesn't want to admit she's dead, but he does. What he really doesn't want to admit is that he killed her and that's why she's dead. That That's really what he doesn't want to face, but, you know. But, but he'll admit that he killed friends and co-workers just to move from a security officer to a sergeant that is the head of a research project that ends up just basically driving people insane till they die, eating each other, or exploding. In fact, this guy even says that he murdered two people who were his competition, who really weren't really his competition as much as they were trying to just continue his work. But he will admit that he killed his friends and co-workers just to move from a security officer to a sergeant that is head of a research project that ends up just basically driving people insane until they die, eat each other, or possibly explode. Or all three options. Or maybe something new, I don't know. In fact, this guy even says that he murdered two people who were his quote-unquote competition, who were actually just chosen before him for the project. Because he was so fucking unstable. He even knows he should have been caught for his crimes and he wasn't. In fact, when he ambushed the men, it was right after the party where the two men were celebrating taking over the assignment. They were shot by Wright's own gun, a military-issued weapon, but in the, la in the later part of the next day, he discovered the murders were reported to be by some military resistance fighters. And those quote-unquote fighter fighters were found and executed to say the least which is like executed is in quotes as well because at this point it's just like how many fucking bodies um 
How many fucking bodies, right? You know? And, like, as, as much as Wright tried to say he wasn't guilty of murder throughout this book, he sure didn't take a lot of lives without consideration to them. So Wright ends up being approached by Colonel Oliver Portu, who happened to be the guy who sliced himself open for Wright earlier amid the slow jellyfish-cloaked people that he and Hobbes moved through. Portu was the one who told Wright that he would be in charge of the project, just like he had hoped and planned for. Wright suddenly remembered how many times the colonel's name popped up in his military career as well, which I have to say isn't too terribly weird. What would be weird is if he had been the one constantly there the entire time. I think that's what the writer was alluding to, but I'm not sure. Um, in most cases, officers and higher-ups rotate their locations frequently, especially if they are in deployments coming and shit like that. So when I say consistently, I mean like the only military authority figure that was so high, um, that's constantly been a presence in his career. So I think that's what the writer was trying to say with that, but I'm not sure because it's still kind of vague for me. Or maybe I'm looking too far into it. I don't mean to do that, it just happens though. So Wright realizes that through all this crazy weirdness that the tether recall would release the worm into reality, and he did a big nah to that. Somehow he thinks that because he's a murdering bastard that meant he was supposed to be this brand new dark messiah that ushers in the rapture of death, despair, and travesty, and as romantic as that is, I just think Wright is fully insane at this point. Now, Wright wants to back out. And that doesn't happen. In fact, his little da daughter thing goes full demon and bites his hand. And I mean, full on like, like pit bull greed. Like she's not letting go until she wants to, right? And that causes him to actually see what she looks like for the first time. And it is not the prettiest sight. In fact, he eats that thing, which he starts dragging him across the hallway to get to the room that they need to get to. It's like another teller room, but it's for the recall specifically. Um, and his hands fill with the weird-ass needle teeth that she's got, and it tore through tendons as the monster daughter dragged him along and shit. And it was bad, but she really feel bad for right... She would really feel bad for a man who killed people for experimentations he made up, and then killed more people so he could keep killing people for those experimentations. She would really feel bad for a guy who murdered his family. And the only reason we know he murdered his family is because at this point his delusions have brought on a full-gone psychosis that is dr the driving force, which is the family that he's done wrong now wants him to destroy the rest of the world. As punishment for hurting them. No, 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 we don't. So the monster has right at the door and tells him to open it. And he says he doesn't have access to the door thingy, which is true. But monster daughter goes, Grr, you have another way to get in, asshole. So he uses the back door passcode to get in. Monster Daughter drags Wright inside and tells him to do the recall. Wright starts the process, and the screen says, Recall or cancel. And he suddenly remembers that if he chooses cancel, the whole system, as well as himself, can be self-destruct. And go big boom boom. And he's like, oh, I never thought about killing myself before. And I think that's weird. Isn't that weird? Is it not the weirdest thing ever? A guy who has gone out of his way to kill people for a pastime, and to kill people to stop him from having that pastime, has never once thought about killing himself. And it's made me wonder if other murderers were like that, but I'm not curious enough to Google it or anything like that. So the daughter monster thing sees what he's trying to do and bit more into his hand and you know he was pretty upset about that and the monster's all like this is your destiny right you're supposed to be the chosen one and then Wright was all like you underestimated my power and much like Anakin Wright makes sure that you were killed 
unlike Obi-Wan Kenobi, who will leave someone for dead in a fucked up way after forcing him from uh, after forcing him to leave his family and his mother to become part of an organization that took him in way too old and is the reason why most of the Jedi are dead. That was the nerd coming out of me, but whatever. <laughs> Monster daughter gets pissed and is like, you fucked me over, man. You fucked me over. And it's about to go full raging on Wright. And Wright is just expecting the worst. Um, it's biting into his hand. Its eyes are glowing. It is just like, I feel like the shaking meme. <coughs> like, triggered. Triggered. Everybody knows what I mean when I say that. Just like that shaking meme where it's all red and it just says triggered and shit. And it's like that, right? Um... And then he wakes up in the medical bay. He doesn't remember how he got there or what happened after the monster's daughter went in on him or how he was saved. And then strangely enough, the narration, who is John Wright, says, are we done? How many more times do I have to retell this story? The story ends the log for, from the... Uh, Chief Medical Officer Diane S. Trudit, which I'm going to assume is the same doctor who he um, must have ran into in the beginning when they were all like gathered around and be like, you need to go to the med bay because you're a crazy man, right? And she's going over observations over right, and she says that Wright is using his crazy ass story that he invented in his head to deal with the fact that he murders his entire family. And he also apparently was telling the story so out of order and she couldn't really make heads or tails of what was going on or what exactly he was detailing on and on about, especially at the end. It's obvious that he's living some dark savior fantasy and she doesn't know about him mur murdering other military personnel either, but she wants Colonel Portu to be looked at since he might have been favoring Wright for reasons other than his criminal history and ruthlessness. Because apparently the colonel is the one who suggested that he should be there to begin with. The, anal al the analysis also mentions that she can't really make heads or tails once again of his story since the deep space jump radiation corrupted some data or whatever. But the tether wasn't damaged this time. And she also thinks that it's weird that in his fantasy it revolved around fixing something that wasn't broken. It was also considered a shame... The chief medical officer laments that Wright is the first survivor of the experiment, but they can't figure out which parts of the story are true and which ones are not because, you know, he's kind of nuts. The parts where he definitely had his guilt for his family come out, pretty clear, but everything else is weird as fuck and it really doesn't help with the story at all with trying to make sense of it. Um, the log ends with the doc mentioning that she'll give more results tomorrow, but that was closed down like three weeks ago. Yes. There has been no communication with the Odyssey, where this report came from, for three weeks as we are reading this, and is LIS, or Lost in Space. So how do I feel about this particular story? So the first time I read this, I was still like between the ages of 26 and 29, so I'm not exactly sure what time frame I read this. But the first time I read it, I was kind of hyped up about the story, but also not really once I got to the ending. I could follow everything, but like I've said previously, the whole story seems like it was either rushed, so the editing wasn't done to his normal standard, or maybe it's one of his older stories, and he just decided, fuck it, I'm publishing it as it is. I was tired of looking at it when I was writing it. I'm tired of it now. Everyone else can figure out what the fuck is going on. Um... Which is fine, you know, whatever. But I feel like the story itself could have been more, personally, myself. I feel like the crazy was too muffled by the technical writing he has. Because Heath Path really does well with fantasy mixed with some sci-fi. But I think this went in a direction that I'm not sure he actually intended. But I really don't know. Um, watch this be, like, his favorite fucking story written. And I'm just sitting here, like, critiquing it like an asshole. Makes sense. Um, I, and like I said before, I also believe he's might be a furry, but I think this is before furries were a thing, so I don't think he's a furry furry. Um, that the Hungary Saga would definitely introduce me to furries before I knew furries was a thing. That's how long ago I read this book, because I was deployed 2012. 
when I first started reading him. So that should give you the time frame. This is the time before time is gone by, right? And don't pick on him because he's a really cool guy and I really enjoy a great deal of his works. One of my favorite short stories of his is what I mentioned before, The God Killer, and that's for a good reason. When he writes, he knows he has an idea and a plot in mind that he's writing down and then crumbled it up furiously because it doesn't sound right or at all or stupid or it could just be cut out. And I can relate to that because I used to write stories a lot and it could be so frustrating like, and sometimes it can be frustrating to the point where you don't even want to work on it anymore because you've already put so much work into it. And it's just like, I have to rewrite this entire thing over again because it doesn't make sense why there's a chicken king fighting a gecko because he's selling insurance. Like, you know, it's just little, little weird things that you have to go through with writing. And it can be annoying sometimes, especially when you get shit the way you don't want it to. But I can't fault him for that. And honestly, I think it'd be better for me to try to talk about this book because someone else could be actually interested in this story more than I am. Like, it wasn't my cup of tea, per se. It did capture my attention and it kept me interested. It was just, the ending just, it, it was just the ending because it just seemed like it ended so abruptly and so...